Abt von diesem Tis, das heißt, ich habe das Amt jetzt. I am the retired abbot of this abbey, and uh, younger generations have now taken over responsibility. I've been part of this uh, cloister for quite some time. I was also a teacher for grammar schools and for grown-ups, and I was also a member of different cultural committees. Every person has a different longing for non-material things, that is mental things, spiritual things, and every person seeks them here or there, but this question is surely a lasting challenge for humanity. Do we have other values beyond the superficial, that is possessions, prestige, and fun? The word luxury is, means unnecessary and extravagant and is usually considered to be a negative. But people are always hoping that luxury will add more emotion to their lives. Something might be a forbidden luxury to the one person, yet for someone else it's a luxury allowed without questions. But ultimately, it's not about essential things. It's actually about things which deliver more than just the essentials. We in our civilization are very materialistic and individualistic, and we simply need to rediscover the other values, the values which are behind the superficial ones, spiritual values, like I said before. We look for them all over the globe, yet we often fail to see that they're just around the corner. As a monastery, we have the possibility to reach people, of course, only a small amount of people, but we reach them with religious values and with spiritual values as well. In the end, it depends on whether each person truly lives up to what he or she truly is. Ladies and gentlemen, a cordial welcome. It's wonderful to see that even this large hall is full to the last seat. Uh, that is a clear sign that we quite apparently have picked the right, uh, very important question indeed. Um, the question is, will we be able to find answers? That is what we will look into today. And, um, well, how did we come across our topic, our subject here? Perhaps I may share a very personal experience with you. I had the pleasure to uh, be responsible for an island of the Seychelles for four years, a very exclusive island indeed. And one day, it was a very stormy day, and uh, we had the wind blowing with a strength of eight. We had waves that were up to three or four meters high. And I had a furious guest who was standing at the reception desk. And he said that he would have to return right now without any other possibility. He didn't have a choice. There was a business partner waiting for him. And I tried to explain to that man that in spite of the money that he was offering me and that he just could not start this journey under any circumstances because it was life-threatening and this gentleman didn't want to understand what I was saying. And that actually got me thinking because how can someone who, you know, 
at least gives you the impression that he knows what he's doing and he's rather successful in what he's doing. How can such a person not recognize the fact that there are forces that are more powerful than human beings? And how could it be that in 2016, after all the discussions, all the reports and uh, news and everything, how could there still be people that have not understood that we are not the masters of the universe, but members of the universe? And, you know, suddenly a whole process uh, was triggered in my head and, uh, you know, I started thinking. And one of the results of this uh, round of thinking is this uh, discussion panel that we have on stage here today. We want to raise questions. We want to try to answer some questions. And I'm very pleased to be now able to give the floor to Abbot Daniel, who will help us uh, find our way along these questions. Good morning to all of you. I somehow felt like I was a strange bird that was invited to the ITB. But, uh, you know, when I went through the different halls, I saw that there were quite a few strange birds running around here. But they are all linked by one thing that they have in common, and that is a certain desire, a certain longing, and that is what we want to look into here. I already said that in our video trailer. What is luxury? Luxury in the original sense um, is something that is uh, superficial and is actually um, uh, rather wasteful, which comes from uh, the devil rather than from God, and yet we enjoy luxury. We reformulated it into something that we would like to have and uh, something of which we would like to have more and more. Something that carries a promise for us and uh, that promise is to provide us with more than that uh, which is just essential. And as I said in the movie clip, it's something emotional. We all think that we are, you know, thinking rational beings and uh, the human beings always say that we are actually the cusp of creation. And if we could, we would hear the monkeys laughing in the jungle because we're all very emotional beings. And if our emotion is right, then everything is right. You can have the biggest uh, ideas and intellectual constructs, but if there is no emotionality behind it, this idea will never be asserted. I'm uh, doing my work in the area of interpersonal relationships. I'm taking care of people. I've got, um, you know, a Rolodex of 4,000 names. And uh, what I always, first of all, want to try and find out is what are the needs behind the things that we try to do. And this also pertains to traveling because this now is a event that focuses on traveling and tourism. And when I looked into these questions, something struck me. I am part of a community which is called uh, the Benedict, and uh, we have to um, make a vow, a vow for stability. I belong to one certain place. The, uh, that is true for all the Benedictines. And, you know, I belong to a place, but I'm also part of a community. And a monastery is just this small cell. It's not uh, like a huge, um, you know, union of people like the like the, the orders that came later, and yet we are distributed all over the world. And that was one of the nicest experience to uh, meet 260 abbots at a Congress of abbots uh, coming from all over the globe and exchange our experiences and views. And when I you know, walked around here through the trade fair halls, I encountered things in different corners here that uh, reminded me of things, you know. So I vowed to, uh, made a vow to stability, but I still traveled the world. But what did I do? And the world. Did I just try to collect experiences? You could do that. You can collect experiences because you think that these experiences hold a promise. It's either that you're hoping for property. You can, you know, show off that you can afford what others can afford or even more than that. Or you can go shopping for fun. So you can buy fun, if you will. But of course, in the long run, this will not satisfy you. You can try to collect experiences like others would collect stamps. But what really is the most important thing for human beings is not experience in the sense that you experience something. But, uh, you know, um, but actually what it gives you, you know. And in the recent past, uh, you know, I uh, met uh, someone 
who uh, I met a long time ago. And, uh, you know, th this encounter, I could not turn into a substantial experience. You know, back then there, there were, you know, uh, protests of farmers in that country where I went to. Um, uh, and the farmers were blocking the roads but with uh, manure. Had I been able to experience that, I think it would have uh, been an entirely different experience. But, uh, you know, there are things that can actually be converted uh, into a long-lasting experience that changes your life. And that is uh, something that uh, we're all striving for. And it uh, shall go deeper than, you know, just being able to tick off the di different boxes and to be able to say, OK, I've seen this, I've done that, I've enjoyed this or that. And, and of course, also difficult uh, uh, situations can give you an insight into who you are and what human beings are like, because every individual is creating the world for themselves. And that is why no one has the right to blame someone else. If you behave just a little better, then I would also feel a little better. That is nonsense. Every person creates the world for themselves. Of course, the world provides information, but the way how you deal with the information, that is what you're doing yourself. And the question is what you're headed for, what you're trying to do. Well, we want to have a fulfilled life, whatever we think that may be. But of course, it's not just you know superficial experiences, uh, but rather the deep ones. That's what we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd love to just, you know, uh, interrupt proceedings for a couple of moments so that, uh, you know, these words can settle in your minds. You know, these words speak for themselves. And yet we are here as members of a discussion round. May I introduce uh, Brett McDonald sitting on the far right here from uh, South Africa, from Botswana. And he is the operator for many different lodges there, elephant here, rhino over there and a cheetah in the back, and uh, in a beautiful environment, a uh, natural environment that is untouched. And uh, is he now a pioneer of modern luxury, the new understanding of luxury? He will give us a report. Then Abbot Daniel, as I said, and uh, she takes people onto journeys into all uh, different corners of the world. She will also give us a very nice account on what she thinks where we're headed for. And uh, then Dr. Thomas Ellis, who is a journalist and an expert in uh, matters of cruises. There is the whole cruise industry to talk about. Uh, so how this, you know, uh, thing evolved from Darwin, who on the Beagle went to the Galapagos Island uh, and up till today, where we've got swimming ghettos with 5,000 people squeezed into one ship, cruising the world's oceans and everything in between. Thank you very much for all of you for being here. It really is a pleasure. Now, within the context of our question of uh, what we are headed for, I would like to first make a critical remark or formulate a critical question, if you will. In our uh, economy studies at university, we learn about models, economic models. And these economic models, they all date back to the 19th century. And in these economic models, we can find, you know, towards the end, uh, a formula, for example. And this formula also contains Greek letters for constants that you cannot really really calculate. And then you can read so it's a paribus. That means that the constants always remain the same. And uh, you know, and uh, part of what we learn also is that there are, you know, common goods or free goods, you know, like uh, soil and air and water. And some 150 or 200 years ago, this may have been true, but today it no longer is. And what does that mean? What does it mean? for us, for our economic thinking, what does it mean to us as tourists? Because uh, the tourist, which was invented 150 years ago by the English, a tourist is someone who goes on tours. And he has a task to fulfill, and that is to strive for education. Is that still part of uh, a tourist's task? Is that why they set out on journeys? or? 
you know, let's get back to what the abbot said, you know, the superficial versus the elementary kind of experience. The first question to Brett, what's it like in your case? What is it that the guests do that come to see you? When arriving in South Africa, do they know that they are looking for experiences and will they gain new experiences or will they just have a new T-shirt? I'm running on a, uh, on a translator here, so I'm a few seconds behind everybody else. But uh, thanks, Mark, for the question. People come to us with their hopes and dreams they want us to fulfill. And I think that uh, our job as being in the industry is to let people have a dream about Africa. And when they come there, everything that they've had happen in their minds needs to come to reality. But it needs to be done in a, in, a very, in a very clever way because this word luxury, which is the topic of our discussion, is one of the most abused words in the tourism industry. I uh, came up uh, through the, by way of, of a train this morning and I saw the same man begging on the side of the, of the platform three days in a row. And the wind was cold and he had his little bowl out. Now, if that man, instead of being there, if we could have put him in a bus shelter, that would have been luxury. So we have to now determine what is this, what, what luxury are we looking for? So when people come out to us, we now, I've learned over the years, and that's a discussion you and I had before, is that they're looking for an experience, something that they don't get at home, something that they can take away with them, something that they can, that can touch their lives. And that's also what our abbot was saying, is that sometimes you need to be touched deep down inside here, and that's what we try and do. And I think that that's what's important, if that answers that question. Right, perhaps uh, directly to you, Ms. Dahlmeyer. How do you convey this message? How do you try to do that? How do you filter your guests, if you will, so that you can have the right guests for the right offers? Well, we uh, filter our guests by not just selling highlights, but by selling moments and by turning the, um, you know, the things that you see and do, turn them into real experiences. You know, this is not just about hotel categories and um, a number of sightseeing tours. What we do is we offer framework conditions that allow you to fulfill your dreams and to see your, you know, wishes and desires come true. You know, luxury travels uh, for me are not a legitimation of, uh, of, of wasting and squandering money. Uh, really, the objective is to allow for experiences to happen. So that is why we call it experiential luxury. And we call our moments, you know, me moments because they're so individual for everyone. And the framework conditions uh, are also very individual. You know, the traveling experience that they are looking for when traveling with us or, you know, with other operators, they always have their own expectations and their own dreams. And that is very personal. And that's the basis for creating our framework conditions. And that is what we have in place as a filter. We are looking for the guests who are actually looking for this kind of experience. And we assemble then the journeys in a tailor-made fashion. And how do you do that? How do you achieve that? And how does this relate to the commercial aspect? Uh, may there be a contradiction in terms? Well, sometimes it is contradictory, and we also adapted our programs, and sometimes we lose guests who uh, just wanted to have all the traditional highlights, like you know, a string of pearls. Um, but on the other hand, we know that there is a demand of, of guests who want to you know, delve deeper into the countries. And we've got guests with a lot of traveling experiences. And for them, you know, the, this kind of superficial traveling is something that they're not looking for. And we're aware of that, and we try to react to that. We also um, get new customers, new clients, who are looking for a new kind of luxury. And we are reacting to that. So we can actually do without the things that we do not want to be, have as a part of our program any longer. Why don't you just try to define this new luxury? Of course, there is no standard definition because everyone has got their own idea of, uh, of luxury. But it's you know not luxury that is uh, something that you find in categories like five, six star hotel categories. Of course, we've got them as part of our program. But you know one of the most uh, prominent images that people have in their head is that you know people are sitting. Um, you know, um, in front of a salt lake, if you will, and they have a, a beer bottle and a um, and a Coke can 
on their table in front of them. And this is something that people do not associate with traditional luxury. That would be grand hotelery with full service and high-end offers. But the experience that these people can have on the shores of that Salt Lake, to be lonely or rather, you know, alone there in this kind of spectacular natural experience that you can have in the Nabib Desert or in, in places where you do not need luxury, but, you know, you only need the space and the time and someone who takes you there and uh, who knows about these kinds of locations and who offers you enough space to actually enjoy this experience. Okay, uh, dot, dot, dot means space and time. Yeah, space and time for people who know to appreciate it. And how do you do that on a cruise ship? Well, a cruise ship is an environment where we have enormous amounts of space. But unfortunately, that space, which is the ocean, we can't make use of. We have to stay on that boat. And then, of course, space becomes an issue. You just said uh, uh, 5,000 uh, people on cruise ships. We know that in the ultra luxury segment, well, we don't exactly know because uh, many uh, cruise ship operators uh, even claim that even the 5,000 people cruise ships are luxury cruise liners but of course that is nonsense you know that you know it's just not possible you can't have 5,000 guests plus 2,000 crew this cannot be a luxury offer because we need space we need time and that is exactly what uh, really makes the difference in the ultra luxury segments also in cruising and uh, you also need to have access to nature you know it sounds trivial but uh, you know, need to have access also to the ocean. And that is something that gets lost with these mainstream cruise ships. So we need to have compensation strategies in order to avoid people, you know, um, becoming frustrated, you know, with all these different uh, leisure time activities, go-karts and climbing walls and so on and so forth. It, that is not necessarily bad, but what does it have to do with people's desires to go out and cruise the ocean? You know, if I want to have a restaurant, um, um, if we visit a restaurant or a city uh, somewhere, you know, uh, on the coast, but then people always say, of course, but we all uh, we want to have a view of the ocean. Uh, you know, and on the ship, sometimes it's really the, the, the opposite, you know, but on ultra luxury ships, less actually is more, but the less is um, more and, and um, you know, uh, rather expensive. Um, uh, more, more like more ocean or uh, more money? Well, um, of course, to come back to the ingredients that you already mentioned a moment ago, you know, space, for example, space per guest and the time that you can dedicate to individual guests and not to be hectic about your service, but to be rather individual in your service. And of course, we're working in a dream industry in tourism, you know, and you want to make sure that people can have the feeling that their dreams may come true. But the question is where to get that capacity from. It's very interesting, you know, last year during the ITB, we carried out a small survey and uh, we collected the answers of the visitors and we asked you, the visitors, what luxury meant to you. And there was one cat a catalog of criteria containing more than 30 different criteria. And what was very interesting is that the first 15 criteria were non-material in nature. So please, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong or just you know, agree with me. The time of huge bathtubs and crystal chandeliers is over once and for all. Uh, this is the new standard. And I would even go so far as to claim that we are living in times of a kind of democratized luxury with a spending power that today um, allows people to afford very, very much, you know, almost all, everything. So you do not no longer need to have a real crystal uh, a, a glass or, I don't know, a huge towel or 20,000 different uh, types of soaps. This is something that people take as a natural. And we just talked about this a moment ago. And the question or the idea of offering individualized services something rather special, this is something that is nonsense in the luxury segment because people see this as a precondition. And so the question arises, what this, uh, you know, what, what, what is this immaterial, this non-material that people are looking for? It's space, it's time, it's exclusivity. And uh, if, if I may put it like this, if I may add something here, because frequently I think we're dealing with the accumulation of luxury. You're saying, you know, this is a given, but I believe that m much of our industry lives off um, appearing 
pretending to be luxurious because people want to feel this privilege. I can now experience luxury. You talked about democratization of luxury. If you've got cruise ships with four or five thousand people, you still operate with sort of colors and uh, glamorous ocean liner images, quite interesting. I mean, I myself um, noticed that because uh, cruises often don't get rid of this luxury image. It looks luxury liners, whether we're talking big or small vessel, it's always the same. Well, where's it come from? It's the old values which the shipping companies still simulate to a very large extent. And we're not talking about a crystal, cut crystal glass. Oh, thank God the Titanic went down. Now, the idea of democratization is something which is happening in distribution as well. You have platforms that do democratize luxury because luxury is something which is a targeted sell. There is only a very small segment of luxury which does not go down in price. But even luxury does yield management. So that's why you end up with democratized luxury with platforms like Secret Escape, which offer luxury for people with a slightly less fat purse because there are some times when even luxury hotels are happy to sell off. But the question is, is that still luxury in the proper sense? Because because of all the things we've said so far, something really important in a new definition of luxury seems to be the element of exclusivity. Excludere, the Latin root, meaning to exclude something, to shut off or leave out. So it has to be small. It has to be a limited offer. How do we deal with that? You know, it seems to me that there's been a quantum shift in the last couple of years in what real luxury tourism is. And even I had to re reevaluate my mindset on this. When we built a, a boutique river cruise boat on, on the Chobe River, I also thought at the stage that uh, the Radal uh, cut uh, crystal glasses was going to be important. And then I watched the people coming through this boat of ours and what made them excited. They loved what we did, which is great. But which is? We had a, a boat called the Zambezi Queen on, on the Chobe River. Um, it only had 14 suites, and uh, we spent a lot of time making it really lovely. But we would take people off the boat and put them on the shore for a dinner under the stars. Now, literally, that, shall we call that restaurant, that boma, cost nothing to put together. And what we did is we did a little smoke smudge fire on the one side so that there'd be a little bit of smoke in the air, and we had laser pointers, no aircraft but close by, and we would teach the people what, what the star patterns were and show them how the old people used to know when to start to uh, plow their fields, and the old bushmen, how they used to um, follow the stars, how they'd navigate by them, etc. We'd cook for them in open fires, and all of a sudden, the most important thing that all these people took home was the power of that Boma dinner absolutely outweighed everything. All the millions we put into building this boat was now superseded by this natural experience. We'd tell people to take their shoes off, let them feel the sand. We'd walk them through, and then as they're going through to it, we'd blow the candles out on the way. So by the time they got there, it was pitch black. A lot of people had never seen the stars like this. And we'll just say, look up at this, and it just blew their mind. So it's exactly following the line that, uh, that you were saying. Give people pay, place, give people an area to get back to nature. And as Abbott said as well, sometimes you've, just, you've got to get back in touch with creation. It really is an amazing thing. Isn't it, nicht erstaunlich, dass Isn't it amazing that everything that we're trying to put together here a bit like uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is back to the nature, or as we call it today, back to the roots. So can one of the prerequisites, if you like, or a premise for this event be the take-home message that luxury is a nature experience, um, going back to the origin? Is it also possible that with that sort of experience, it is what is honest, what is authentic that proves fascinating? Maybe in the last 20, 30 years, we went too much into an artificial world. Maybe we were driven into a world which is characterized by a sham beauty, great words, advertising messages, but that people are simply fed up with that. Maybe it's the pendulum swimming, swinging back to the things that genuinely matter, things that are genuine, true. Abbott, what do you think? 
Well, we have a school in our monastery, a grammar school. And uh, every generation, of course, has its very own needs. The students of today, they're just walking around like this, always having their mobile phones ahead of them. They're, they're all using their smartphones. I don't know whether it is fulfilling for them, but they have to do it to be part of something. That is a primeval need that people have. They want to belong. And the question is, of course, uh, that we make sure we don't lose ourselves. It's important to still have enough time for yourself. My best trip was a trip to Patmos. Patmos is the place where legend tells us um, St. John the Evangelist wrote uh, the Gospel of, and the Apocalypse. We read the documents, we studied the teachings, and then went to Patmos. And of course, at night, the cruise ships came. They just got the people out there very quickly. You know, this is the Apocalypse, and now go down and back to the cruise ship. But we didn't do that. We took time. The luxury cruise ships may stay overnight. No, no truly, I, I don't want to contradict what you're saying in principle, but simply to say, I mean, the cruise ships sort of disgorge the, the people. It's the, the cheaper cruises. They, they do it all quickly, but the luxury cruise liners will give people a little more time. Now, my point was that on this island, there are people where you could feel they are connected to their origin. One is Robert Lacks, but maybe the most important sort of um, philosopher and, and writer. He was brought up in New York, part of the intellectual elite, but he did ultimately find his location on that island. And there are people like him who, when you meet them, you, you really perceive that that is somebody who is deep-rooted where he is. Robert Lacks was perhaps his greatest teacher because he never taught uh, as a sort of mentor. And once he came down from his house to the port, walking extremely slowly, the captain saw, oh, this guy's going to be late. But he waited for him, and he told him, if you'd raced down, I'd have left before you got there. But Robert Lacks, in his writing, I mean, he writes a very sort of reduced type of poetry. And there's this little dialogue. A says, the word is getting worse and worse. It's going to perish. And B answers, don't forget to inform me when the time has come, which means, so what? Talking about the world going down, just, you know, don't forget to tell me when the time has come. So I think that is a man who, who had his roots and was aware of them. So you can say that is a, an elitist thing. Not everybody can afford that, nor does everybody want to. But creating such locations would be possible. I mean, a monastery is that type of location. Uh, the Benedictine order has always showed hospitality throughout its history. But I mean, there are people who come and go very quickly, busloads of tourists. The people we like are the people who stay with us, who experience our life, who can share in what is happening, or who um, do a seminar here. That would be an objective, although that's definitely not mass tourism. I would like to warn against sort of distinguishing good and bad tourism. If the luxury tourist, because he can afford to travel sustainably, because he or she can afford to go for simplicity if that is offered, but of course, travel business class to get there, and may want barefoot luxury, but still have uh, in-flight Wi-Fi. So you think that's the good tourist, and the bad tourist has the mass tourist, who uh, is on a cruise ship together with 4,000 others. I mean, commercialization and tourism is going to stay with us because ultimately people all want to and have to make money. And it's the only way in which you can finance sustainability. And sustainability isn't just back to roots, back to our origin. I mean, we're not turning back the clock. We have to um, live with what we've achieved and what we've destroyed. But we all now have to preserve what there is and, and achieve awareness of that. When we're looking at the young people, and there are many young people here, at some stage, these young people also want to travel. Maybe by that time, they, they don't really marry to their smartphones anymore. But these days, they would say, well, come on, I need Wi-Fi at the airport, or preferably in the hotel as well. I don't want to live in complete isolation. 
You have people who go without, but there, there will always be people who won't. And that's our future. We're talking about future, and we've got the future in this room. Perhaps we don't turn the clock back, but uh, maybe the world will turn our clock back. Because because there are limitations, or what do you mean? Well, yeah, because there are limits to what one can do, and and eternal growth is something which, particularly in tourism, is not something to which there is no ceiling. And in some areas, you can grow and grow, and some things happen in the background, and you can hide it for a while. But in tourism, I mean, as I said earlier, I think we all agree on that. We live in an industry which is a dream. I mean, there was a German TV series called The Dream Cruise Ship, not. You know, good name. Dream is what the industry is too. We have dreams. Yeah, you know, if you want to grow, I don't know, in the uh, plumbing sector or in the aluminium piping sector, that's one thing. But to grow in tourism, where we're selling people dreams, how long can we do that if we just go on growing, growing, growing? Well, it is a fact, and we know that from business, that every single product has a product cycle that starts at some stage. And then there is growth phase. <laughs> and then there is a phase of consolidation, which you call saturation as well. So what happens if we are right in one of these saturation periods? Please allow me to sort of go back a bit here. What happens if our model, our business models, our economic models, which are exclusively geared towards growth, prove to be wrong? I would like to remind you of Tuesday, the official opening of ITB. At that time, Secretary General of the UNWTO, Mr. Rima Talib, was there. And um, he told us about the outlook for the future. I mean, at the moment, we've got 1.18 billion tourists. The, uh, the goal is to go up uh, from that growth, growth, growth. But two minutes after that, we heard about sustainability. And sustainability, with all its different facets, was mentioned, you know, the conserving aspect, the beauty of the planet. There is a very interesting statistics which tells us that until 1850, the global population was more than 500, never more than 500 million people. Today, we've got 7 billion people. But this world is still the same size it was back then. The planet hasn't grown one little bit. And now, all of a sudden, everybody wants to travel all over the world. Now, we have a product cycle. Um, so now we, we have to find a way of dealing with that product, and especially in relation to luxury. The Abbott said it's important to put down roots, and we said earlier it's about time and space. And What we see here is a huge contradiction that is emerging, and it is a very contradiction where the sector of tourism, particularly the luxury segment, is paralyzed question is, where does this trip go? How can we take a step forward? Now, there are some who will hold on to the status quo. That's how things are, and that's how they've always been, and that's fine. And then they dress it all up with beautiful advertising slogans, and fine. But there are others who say, no, that cannot be. And then we have uh, uh, Brett, for example, who has his own products and, and tries to find an answer for that. Is that an answer? The answer lies in this room. Everybody here is involved in the tourism industry, and it really is your decision as to who travels where and why. And it's also up to you to make sure that your clients are going to get the right experience and handle it correctly. Let me give you a little example. I live on the Chobe River. There are only 35 boats on the Chobe River. Now, that is very, very few. But the problem is the agents all tell their clients to go for the sunset tour at 3.30. So guess what happens? At 3.30, there's an, uh, an armada of vessels leaving at the same time. And then people say, look at this, this place is crowded. Now, what should happen? What you should be doing as the tour operator is to speak to the person who's on the ground, a person like me, and say, what is going to be the best? Now, you can go for a, a wonderful lunchtime trip you'll be one of the few people on the river. There's nothing better than doing a lunchtime trip, have a meal cooked on the boat while you're cruising along. You can go for a full day trip into a park. Why make your tourists go at six o'clock in the morning and at three o'clock in the afternoon? Sorry, if my voice sounds bad, I've been on a long road show and it's got a little bit rough. But if, if we 
control what our people do. The problems are going to be reduced. If we make sure that we give them an experiential experience, it doesn't cost money. Strangely enough, it doesn't cost money. I'm going to give you a little, a little illustration. I hosted one of the wealthiest people in Asia. Um, he had hosted me overseas. And believe it or not, he flew in Jose Carreras to sing for us at dinner. It was one of the most amazing things I'd ever come across. Now, when he came back out to Africa, how do I repay this incredible gift that he's given me? Now, what I did was I set a line of, of, of lights going into the bush, just paraffin lanterns. Um, him and I walked this, this line. My staff blew them out and behind us. And at the end, we had a, a silver bucket with a bottle of champagne in it and two glasses and two chairs. And he looked at me like I'd gone mad. And I said to him, don't worry. Just sit and have a seat. Just listen. I said, because what I've arranged for you, you organized for me one of the greatest tenors of the world. I'm going to give you nature's symphony. And there was a silence because the animals and the creatures heard us. And I said, listen, while I put together this, this whole opera. And I said, we'll have the tenors we'll have the sopranos, and then the crickets and the tree frogs and everything started. It cost nothing to do that excepting a bottle of champagne. So you can ask your operator, you should actually force your operator to make sure that he gives your clients a luxury experience without putting a monster price tag on it. Because if we go back to nature, it's like the good book says, is that if we keep our eyes simple, our heart will be bright. And really, sometimes the most simplest things in life are the most luxurious things in life. Isn't it fascinating that once again we can look right inside ourselves, that we can move away, you know, the, the champagne in the cooler, that's just decoration. What's really important, that's, that's our senses and also the feeling of being well cared for. But that's a huge challenge for a tour operator, because if this is what people need, and please allow me now to distinguish between high end and top end. Well, let, let's simply use as a hypothesis, a top end visitor guest is, is the, the, the opinion maker. Somebody with certain influence all over the world. So that has a lot of impact on, on other people who will follow his or her example. How do you deal with that guest? How do you wrap up what you offer? How do you get the message across? And is this something that makes sense to you at all? Is it something which is luxury? Is it something which you can't sell? Is it something which is commercial? I mean, is it something we should make? commercial. It has to be commercial because ultimately we all want to make money. And yes, we can get it across by working together with hotels and lodges uh, where people can create just that sort of experience we've just heard about. And after we're not marketing the luxury with sort of golden taps and things like that, we are market dreams or illusions. And we try to do so by really addressing the senses, haptic elements, uh, where people are allowed to sort of handle sheep's wool, get the smell in their noses, or you know, go and, and, and see somewhere where you have a three-dimensional image of a, of a Spanish wall tile or something like that. So we try to market this also by means of perception. But still, uh, it's, it's something we are almost subject to the laws of the market. The tourism itself is not something which is a, a model which is going to disappear. We've been discussing that at nauseum. We're not going to, to uh, put bars around China, Germany, or the UK to stop people from traveling, because then the whole industry wouldn't work. Certainly, there has to be some sort of reglementation, although we are all very happy that we could travel without needing visas all the time, because that freedom is a very big issue for the global economy and globalization with all the pros and cons thrives on that. But we certainly live in an, an island of the blessed when we're talking about luxury tourism. But there is always one aspect which we mustn't forget. The people who go on these trips have to be able to afford it. Not everyone who goes to mass tourism simply can afford luxury uh, tourism because mass production has certain market conditions and our production has, has very different conditions. And here we can work with a lunch like, like what we just heard about, but that would probably be something costing a thousand euros a night. 
And if you have another, I know obviously the, the overnight prices will be different. There will be some basic uh, experiences offered, but there is a lot of different. If you have industrial production, I have some sort of waste products. Simple as that. I would like to uh, come to the famous Billy um, bookcase that IKEA sells. We can talk about the IKEAization of tourism, if you like. Uh, we all know um, the Billy bookcase can only be produced because there are masses of it, and it is globally available because it's been standardized. It's neither individual. I think nobody would consider that sort of bookcase a luxury item. If you want a luxury bookcase, I mean, you can have that. But then you quickly end up a uh, factor 30, 40 times more expensive. It's not a problem to get that in Berlin. I mean, yesterday I went to some of the furniture shops because I'm, I'm interested in the design that is happening in Berlin. I mean, design is always interesting to me So, uh, because it has a lot to do with tourism and, and chips. Design is important for me. So you can go to another uh, functionary and get a f spend 4,000 euros on the similar type of bookcase, but that would be meant much more personalized. But let's, let's not go back and have the pendulum swing back into the materialistic idea too much, because I think on the basis of what we've been trying to sort of um, filter um, in, in this discussion is, and, and what we've seen coming out of that filter we've been going through is that it's not the, the material things that matters, it's more the intangible, the spiritual things that suddenly are being rediscovered. Maybe that is the, the opposite of what we used to have, which was perhaps an excessive uh, sort of uh, being flooded with stimulant. But, but you live in a society where you can't calm down anywhere. We've got 27 round the cock plug presence and uh, influences. I think what is so amazing, which, which Brett said, which I also experienced myself, is that quite often you can call it a modern new luxury experience, which doesn't actually cost anything. Most things that are really good in life don't cost anything, was an interjection. But the speaker continues, why is that something which should only be accessible to the rich and famous in the world? I think that is not the case. But what is going to be the difficult thing is to achieve a sort of sensible uh, restriction or limitation. The question is, how do we do that? Because let me repeat, we can't forget, we've all got this little ball that is our Earth where we're traveling. It's not getting any bigger. But the way we behave may mean it gets smaller, actually, because we feel that uh, we rule the world. Uh, we have done it. We have made it uh, subject, our subject. But it didn't really work. History has showed that very clearly. We must learn to live and work with the planet and not against it or rule it. And I think this is exactly the point where I think the new luxury comes uh, to, to into play. The question is, what do we do in concrete terms? He's got an answer. He's got an answer. What's the cruise ship industry do? I mean, on the one hand, you... Um, Get you know, provide a ghetto for mass uh, tourism, uh, go through the Adriatic once round, and that's it, and then you return. How do you deal with a new type of tourism, the new luxury? And very clearly, less is more is the slogan. And this less that is more is luxury. You've got to be able, wish to, and be able to allow this. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult and crucial. You can't say it costs nothing, because uh, building a smaller cruise ship in this day and age is prohibitively expensive. And I, I don't want to uh, go into too much detail with the economy of scale models, but when we're talking cruise ships, I mean, the more people you get into one, the more profitable the business tends to be. It's very, very difficult to build smaller ones. That's why we see very few to know of the smaller cruise ships. Uh, it's slightly changing because the new luxury is also entering the cruise ship industry, but we do see um, disproportionately um, large numbers of large cruise ships, uh, there, there are very few vessels for few passengers because the commercialization aspect is made much more difficult if there are smaller. But there is another point I would like to pick up on which you mentioned, this this sort of the satisfaction inside yourself. We hear that sort of thing often, the, the inner happiness. It always sounds brilliant. You can sell it easily to people. But ultimately, when you're on board, and I often uh, observe the guests, the passengers, and sometimes it's absolutely appalling to see that there are so many frustrated, nervous people who get on board, uh, and they really want emotionality. They want to be liked. They want to belong. 
and on, on a sort of cruise ship, where you can say, yes, we are in the same boat, literally. Um, but uh, maybe it, it is even more noticeable because there's no way of escaping the confines of the world. I mean, you can a bit when you're, once you're uh, on uh, dry land again, but you have this community on, on, on board. Some people are afraid of just that. Others want it because it's a bit like a monastery. Sometimes I must admit I feel a bit like that too in the, in the positive sense. Uh, sort of, you know, you, you are well cared for. You may be exposed to the elements. It's a storm raging outside, but I've got this this ship which helps me to survive and to see things which otherwise I would never see, because after all, I can't just sort of, you know, swim out. I mean, um, maybe I've heard that there was somebody once who could walk over water. I can't. So I need some sort of vessel to provide that sort of link for me and nature. But it gives me a chance to have a nature experience. And the luxury segment that is very much uh, the fashion at the moment, expedition-type cruises, to go somewhere where you wouldn't get on otherwise, where the big boats don't go anyway. Ultimately, this is all the old longing that human beings have to do things that many others can't or won't do. Whether it's something that will ultimately satisfy somebody, unless you're satisfied within yourself anyway, you can uh, run with a sophisticated anything into the remotest corner of the world, you'll never be happy. That goes without saying. Have we perhaps reached a point here where we should talk about responsibility? And what's our responsibility? as uh, somebody who provides a touristic uh, experience and on what is the responsibility of just those guests. I'm speaking of the decision makers, the opinion leaders who are on your boats, who are um, going to you to visit the bush, or people who just sort of find themselves somewhere. These are the very people who ultimately can take us all by the hand because of the companies they're on, the political offices they hold, the various functions which they may exercise in the entertainment uh, industry, in, in show business, in film or whatever. But they can lead us in one way or the other. They can be role models, uh, people to follow. How can we make sure that the responsibility that we have for what we do can be communicated to them? How do you do it? How do you do it? We, sorry, but our, um, responsibility is to buy in programs, products, buy and then sell products that live up to just that expectations where I don't need to have a bad conscience about using that. And if the opinion leader um, has that experience too, then of course there will be a multiplying factor from that. Somebody who's visited uh, the South Pole um, of course, there is a, a limitation, X number of people on board of Y boats going to Elephant Island or where have you. That person can understand it because once he or she experienced the, the quiet, the calm, that gives people a motivation to protect and preserve that. And that will be a multiplying factor. And I can work with these multipliers with the social media these days. It makes it much easier than it used to be. But ultimately, responsibility is in the, the, the origin, i.e. in us, to buy in that sort of trip, the tour, that I make it possible for people to have that experience and not do it at times when time, space experiences cannot be communicated, which, of course, is rather elitist when I uh, draw that conclusion saying, you know, I'm allowed to do that, but you won't be able to. Yeah, of course, but we talk about limitations. I mean, that is an exclusion, isn't it? Yes, but, but there has to be a way of limiting um, the number of visitors. Um, sort of regulating through price, that's exactly what the Seychelles have been doing for, for yonks, and that is working. Sadly, it is a huge luxury to be environmentally friendly. It's something which happens in tourism in general, but especially when we're talking cruise ships, it's mentioned all the time. Um, shipping, particularly cruise um, cruises and cruises amount of shipping in general, 0.75% of global uh, merchant fleet um, are cruise ships. So it's a tiny amount, but that is the amount which is really, really highlighted. People want to experience nature, the sea. I mean, you need the sea. If you imagine that uh, we're only, you know, trawling the, the, the dirtiest sort of um, places you can think, muddy waters, filthy, you don't want that. But the cruise ship industry, often criticized, actually tries um, to find solutions, technology, in particular technological solutions for the whole shipping industry, which you can't just buy around the corner, which have to be developed specially. But sadly, and I, I'm very critical myself about this, we make all these promises but can't always keep them, and yet there's a lot happening anyway. 
And I think luxury, to some extent, is also reflected in our attempt to develop technologies and opportunities to make the whole uh, world of shipping more environmentally friendly. We all buy bananas, and we want them cheap, and transport doesn't matter. But every banana is full of heavy oil, if you like, uh, in, in this sort of sense. And, and we should be aware of that. And there's another contradiction, of course. It's particularly the ultra-luxury cruise ship segment. They're the ones who, as a rule, uh, haven't got the best sort of record uh, regarding environmental friendliness. And there, something has to change. I'm completely in favor of um, coming up with a lot more solutions here, because it's m basically mainstream uh, shipping companies who use alternative um, engines and um, have their own water treatment uh, systems on board. When you have very small uh, vessels, I don't know Brett's um, uh, systems, I mean, how environmentally friendly these are. I mean, we have a lot of standards, environmental standards, and I don't know to what extent you've been able to implement all of this, because the scale is, is the matter here. I mean, and that's another problem. The smaller the vessel, um, the less room there is for all this state-of-the-art technology, and, and the less money there is in order to properly do all these things in such a way that we can say, yes, we do things more or less environmentally friendly. I think that's also a bit of an inherent contradiction in the ultra-luxury cruise ship industry, which we still have to resolve. We have come Responsibility. We are quickly approaching the end of our session here, but responsibility. How do we actually implement responsibility? How do we do that? Um, we've just got to take it on in our own conscience. I think that we're the people who have to sleep at night in our own minds and on our own bodies. And as far as I'm concerned, it's up to us to make sure that whatever we do is right. Um, you asked briefly that small vessel. We've got a few of them, but that one had onboard processing of water through reverse osmosis, it has onboard uh, sewage processing plant, it has ways of keeping the, heat, the hot water and re-putting it through the systems. So it can be done. It just means, are you prepared to do it? And the other thing is, you, these people have in their mind that luxury is expensive. Luxury, if you remember my first comments when I spoke about the beggar with his bowl when I walked past, to him, a bus shelter would be luxury. We have products which range from 150 US dollars per person per night right up to $1,000 per person per night. And I promise you, I can offer luxury in the 150 market where I'll give people an experience which will blow their minds right the way through to $1,000 a night. So it all depends. As I said, luxury doesn't need to cost money. It's getting back to your, your roots, back to your senses, and to make you feel like you're reconnecting with nature. Ab Daniel, Verantwortung. Abbott Daniel, on responsibility, what is our responsibility when talking about this subject? Well, human beings learn best through imitation. So if we ourselves act as role models, if we do the things not that everybody does, but if we really question what we're doing and if we get the right information and act accordingly, then we really stand a chance that there will be people emulating our example. You know, I don't want to say that there is good or bad tourism. I'm, there is only tourism that is very specific to the target groups, and I think that is where we find our responsibility. We have to act in a way that uh, others are fascinated by what we're doing. I think we don't uh, have anything to add to that. And with that, I would like to thank all of you most cordially. Please take these messages home, and I'm looking forward to sustainable, smart, and uh, lively and uh, you know, thrilling luxury tourism. Thank you very much.